Hello there. Welcome to the Strong by Design podcast show. Hosting today, Coach Chris. So great. Uh, so great. So great. So great. I'm so excited. I can't speak. It's a. It's going to be a good one. Uh, it's so great to have you. And and by the way, I don't edit out mistakes. Okay, I, that's not how we roll here at Strong by Design. I'm a human being. I mess up. I make mistakes a lot. If you ask my wife, and um, so I just let it roll here. So I hope you just let it roll in your life. If this is the first time you've joined the Strong by Design podcast, fantastic to have you. Thank you so much. You've landed on a great episode to start with. I think we're going to get into a lot of interesting topics today, a lot of natural questions that I already have for our amazing guest today. Uh, If you're a longtime listener of the show, then welcome back. You know you're in for another treat here. Every week we, re- we release a, a, a new episode, a, a new conversation that will help you in your life, in body, in mind, in spirit, in some way. There is no topic or subject matter we are afraid to explore or talk about. And that's what makes our show so great and so beneficial to me personally. Uh, a lot of growth and self-development for me as a host of a podcast for the last five years, getting to speak with some just terrific men and women, people that are far more intelligent than I, who have been through the struggles of life, who have done amazing things, and I get to talk with them. And and you're a listener, so you get to then eavesdrop a little bit and to have some great things to, to walk away with uh, to help you in your day. And that's why we do this show. This show is basically a ministry for us here at Critical Bench. We are a fitness and health publishing company. And several years ago, we just thought, you know what? It's time to do a podcast. A lot of other people are doing it and they're, they're loving it. Let's do it. And it has been nothing more than fantastic from day one. And I'm just so blessed to be one of the hosts of the show. And and uh, so, again, so happy to have you. So uh, I'll have a few more kind words uh, for you at the end of the conversation today. So our very special guest, Aaron File. I did uh, get the pronunciation right because I do confirm that prior to speaking with our guests. If it's a, a name, I'm not 100. If it's Smith, I feel pretty comfortable. But if it's anything other than that, I usually try and clarify. So. Erin has an amazing story, and you're going to get to hear some of that today. She uh, got a BA in psychology and an MA in digital media. So she blended those two things together, all right? So she knows technology, and she knows psychology, okay? And so she's blended these two things together, and the work that she's doing today with her business, MindFix, is fantastic. And um, you'll probably want to click over and watch some of these great testimonials on her platform after you finish listening to the podcast. Again, we're going to hear about her amazing story today. She has been featured in books, magazines, podcasts, webinars, you name it. It's it's out there and it's uh, helping people all around the world who are or were already successful, but to actually see their success in a new way. And I think that's a a big takeaway from today's conversation is that sometimes it's just a mindset shift that a lot of us need in order to just fix our programming. Internal programming needs to be corrected. So Aaron, thank you so much for being a guest on Strong by Design. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Great to have you. Love your little artwork on the wall there behind you. Is that that your own or is it you can't take credit? (laughs) One of my best friends uh, gave it to me as a Christmas present, and it's just something that brings me a lot of joy. Yeah, it's great. It reminds me of like Monsters, Inc. or something, like the little creature with big eyeballs and stuff. I like it. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. That's fun. Very cool. So, again, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. You were introduced to uh, our team uh, some months ago from a close friend of ours who said, you have to have this person. You have to do something with this person. You have to speak with them. You need to get to know them. And some time went by, but we were able to, to connect and get this conversation on the podcast, which is fantastic. And we really appreciate that. Um, so please share a little bit about yourself, just so our listeners get to know you just a little bit, maybe uh, a little bit about yourself personally, but what you and your team are doing at MindFix, like a bit of an overview, if you would, 
before we dive into some deeper questions. Sure. In terms of an overview of what we do at MindFix or, or the MindFix group, we specialize in working with leaders, entrepreneurs, high achievers, anyone who's highly motivated and excited to change what's not optimal or optimized or what's not working in their lives. And we help uh, our clients identify and then eliminate the biggest mental barriers and roadblocks that are in their way and standing between them and the success, happiness, peace, and fulfillment that they know they're capable of, but they're having a hard time accessing. Our approach is absolutely contrarian and the opposite to what nearly every person who works with us is expecting and has done in the past. Even the people who have done NLP and they've done EMDR and they've done literally 40 years of talk therapy or they've done performance coaching. We rarely, if ever, have people come in and go, oh, I've done this before. And that's because our approach, when I say contrarian, I mean that everything we do here at MindFix with our clients is about success through subtraction. So in most coaching and therapy models, It's a lot of addition. It's a lot of we're going to teach you how to cope with your challenges. We're going to give you strategies and tactics and tools to help you manage the symptoms. Oh, you're having a lot of anxiety. You got to take some ice baths and meditate more so that you can manage the symptom and kind of deal with the anxiety every time it comes up. Are you having anger problems? Here's a tool to count backwards from 10 to try and manage this anger that keeps showing up all the time. That's additive, and that's why people feel like I've been working at something forever is because they're just, it's symptom management. It's like trying to fix the stuffy nose when you have a a really bad milk allergy, right? And it's like, no, you you want to fix the, the, the root problem. So what we do at MindFix, instead of giving people more tools and adding more strategies, is everything is about subtraction. We figure out what's happening that the client doesn't want, you know, whether it's procrastination, perfectionism, imposter syndrome, anxiety. And then what we do is we identify the root cause or causes of why they're experiencing it. And then we subtract those, those root causes. When you subtract the root, imagine, you know, killing a weed at the root, it doesn't come back. You don't have to keep cutting the the weed down over and over. It's simply gone. And so our approach is short term. We don't even have like continuation programs. We really want to allow people to come in identify and eliminate the root causes of their challenges and then get on their way and be successful and fulfilled and, and happy in their lives. So that's yeah. the work that we do at MindFix. I love it. I love it. It's, it's addition by subtraction. <laughs> it's like get better by removing some things because we're all so connected and, and to just about everything happening, you know, whether it's the, the relationships in our lives, right, or, or things at work, we, we are constantly plugged in and tied to all of these things, which can be quite exhausting and, and um, nerve wracking and overwhelming for a lot of people, whether, whether you're a business owner or, you know, work, work for a business, it seems like a, a lot of burdens and, and overwhelm uh, is, a, is the kind of the feeling and the mood of the day. Um, and I mean, I, I, I understand it. I work, (laughs) I work online for a living, um, and I'm responsible for a lot of stuff, but a lot of the best learning that I've done over the years is, is that priority mindset type thing and focusing on the one thing and, and all the other stuff kind of seems to line up a lot better when you're more, more of a narrow focus, I guess, uh, than being so. Uh, overwhelmed by the, all of the things coming at us. Um, what what say you when it comes to that? I mean, is is some of this, and you know, our conversation will probably go in different directions. But is some of this, do you think, a little bit driven by the technology side of our existence as human beings? Some of this overwhelm and and feelings uh, that that people can't seem to get out of their own way or escape escape this anxiety of life? Hmm. It's certainly not helping. I've read quite (laughs) a few number, uh, a number of books um, that have talked about just how uh, people are having dopamine and, you know, deficiencies and 
the dopamine fix and our attention spans have dwindled and we are constantly always looking for the next update the next hit and it's there's this inability to truly be at rest with ourselves without additional information or or data coming in and it's become full-blown addiction level so um does it increase anxiety does it yes it's also an anxiety management tool though to constantly be online there's anxiety that comes up and we zone out with with online and, and social media and things like that so I would say that it's a symptom management tool and it's also exacerbating the underlying issues that exist anyway with people's root self-esteem and self-worth and value, self-doubt and the things that, uh, you know, concerns about money and life in the world, those all exist to begin with. Getting constant data that confirms these things and, and that perpetuates those is uh, just adds you know, fuel to the fire. Right. Yeah, my wife the other day shared a funny meme with me on, on Messenger, and it was it was the mom just sitting there with the, the kid behind her just going on and on, and by each little frame of the comic, how bored the, the, they were. That, you know, and, and I feel like boredom, if you go back, you know, when I grew up in the late 70s and early 80s, you know, it was boredom. Sometimes you were just bored. And as a kid, you had to find ways to entertain yourself. Um, nowadays, it seems like parents are bending over backwards to constantly entertain their child and never let them have moments of boredom. And I think boredom actually can be very productive when you know how to, how to manage yourself with it in terms of you have to start to use your imagination a little bit more and find ways, you know, and I think that kind of starts from a young age, right? But here we are, you know, people listening probably in their 20s, 30s, 40s, right? And they maybe when they were little, they were just given things, right? As soon as they hit a moment of boredom, it was like, here you go, do this, rather than them having to kind of do it on their own a little bit. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know if that necessarily parallels the conversation, but I think all of these things add up at some point to where we are as a society, as a whole. Um, why do you think it's true that people are so weighed down by, by life, if you even agree with that assessment? Like now more than ever, it seems like, like depression and, and, and despair, anxiety, stress in life, even with very successful people, seems like it's at an all time high. Mm. I mean, I could sit here and postulate and guess um, I think it's so multifactorial that I could just start a list of, you know, there's the plastics in the food that we eat and there's increased radiation like from our phones that makes us feel not good and all the foods we have are chemicals so we have nutrient deficiencies and then everybody's on social media so we're feeling disconnected. There's there's a whole myriad of, of like... <laughs> Uh, countless endless, yeah. things that are different than when than you know four three or four generations ago wildly different different stressors and um I, in terms of those are all contributing to the pain in terms of the work that we do though when we're here and we're working with our clients it's not that someone shows up and they're like oh i had it's, you know, I just have a little, little too little, you know, there's just a little bit of iron missing in my diet and that's why I feel bad about myself and that's why I doubt myself. Like there are physical causes of some anxiety and depression. I know this because I've gone through a severe mold toxicity myself that really impacted my thoughts and how I felt. For the most part though, like when people come to us and they're experiencing significant patterns of behavior and patterns of thought, if it's not a actual biological or chemical issue in their body, usually it's, it's something that's going on up here that can be addressed, that makes them more resilient. So when they go back out into the world and they don't eat the perfect nutrition and there are the you know, dangerous waves that might cause some people to feel unsettled and they don't have the perfect relationship with their partner, they're still able to get through without severe issues and depression and anxiety. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I a lot of people listening, I'm sure, have had bouts with that. And I'd like to hear a little bit maybe more about your story, uh, maybe like a synopsis of, of it um, that you touch on on your, uh, on your platform, on your website. Um, I know my wife has, has dealt with that in the past, you know, and it... it, it it seems it seems to take out a lot of people, men or women, different ages, different experiences and and stages of life, and um, it can obviously be extraordinarily uh, say use use the word toxic, but it, it's it almost seems like inescapable, and the people around that person don't really understand that issue and can't seem to help fix it either. Um, and it can be very, kind of feel very, um, ugh, I don't know, the word is, it's, it's scary, but it also feels like, geez, I, there's just like nothing I can, I can do. Helpless, a helpless feeling, I guess. Um, a question I have on this same topic is, why are people, for one, so hard on themselves um, where we seem to focus more on our defeats and the losses in our, in our life, the things that we have not achieved, more so than the wins and the triumphs and the victories, right? We don't, don't we seem to just point out, like, you know, if you take sports, for example, you could have a, a player at any sport have a, a terrific game, but th their focus will be the one mistake that they made in the game. Um, why is that? Why do those moments in our life seem to take up so much of our energy and our, our emotions? Well, as humans, I mean, we do have a negativity bias where our, our brains scan and pick up and remember things more easily that are negative than they are positive. But as someone who has lived before and after, I used to be one of those people. Um, and I'm not anymore. I used to be so critical of my snowboarding that I'd be embarrassed to go out because I'd be like, oh, everybody's watching me mess up or that girl is over there doing a better trick. Um, there was a time in, during my college soccer career where I literally went up to the coaches and I said, I think I'm going to leave the team because I'm just messing up too much and I'm just not, just not good enough. And they're like, you're the captain. You're doing great. What are you talking about? Right. But, um, or I try to go mountain bike riding with friends and instead of being able to enjoy the forest and the trails, I would be on my bike and the whole time going, oh my God, I'm, I'm too slow. They're gonna, they're gonna judge me and I, I, they're gonna not want, I'm too slow and they're gonna think poorly of me. And it was just constant, you know, as I think about, especially my sports endeavors, even though it translated over into business and other areas of my life. Um, you know, you had mentioned why do athletes do this? And it, it, it just, I lived that life for much of my, you know, youth and teen years, early twenties, thirties, like it was just a big part of how I operated. And I thought that's just who I was. What I discovered though, is that the programming in our subconscious, the lines of code that are running in the background that some of us are aware of and some of us are not, are what determine kind of the lenses, kind of almost as if they're glasses over our eyes through which we see the world. So what I uncovered for myself was I had these parts of me, not all of me, but parts of me, small parts of me that would be like, I'm a loser, I'm not good enough. The way to, um, the way to be loved or liked or appreciated is to be uh, the best. If I'm not the best, then everybody's, nobody's gonna like me. What makes me valuable is being better than everybody else. It was this interesting cluster of kind of programs, beliefs that when I said it, oh, that when I said them out loud, it was like, oh yeah, part of me believes that. Not all of me, I know that's not true, but oh gosh, that hits hard. And so what happens is when you have a, these beliefs or these programs, these lines of code, that's like, I'm not good enough. Uh, if I mess up or make a mistake or fail, people won't like me then every time we see these mistakes, if every time we're comparing ourselves to other people, it goes through the lens. That's how we see it. It's proof that we're not good enough. It's proof when the other person looked the other way that they no longer like us because we failed. Um, and it's, it, it completely skews our sense of reality. So those programs have to be identified. And then when they can be deleted, suddenly, instead of seeing people look away because you think they don't like you or your comparison that you're not good enough, all of these things shift and you no longer feel that way. When I cleared out a lot of those lines of code running in the background of my, of my mind, 
I was able to suddenly go for a bike ride without worrying how fast I was going. I went out to the mountain and would go snowboarding and didn't care if someone was looking at me or not. Didn't even notice. Didn't even cross my mind. And when I think back to telling the coaches, you know, in college that I, I should leave the team, I kind of chuckle going, like, oh, oh, gosh, you know, that that's so silly. I didn't even have a conversation with them about my performance. I was just convinced that I was no good. And, and so that is the difference when you have these uh, programs, these beliefs that part of you believes to be true, it makes it, those are what have us engage in specific patterns of behavior, particularly, like you said, looking at what we've done wrong, being ultra critical. There are athletes who we've worked with who have the belief of, um, if I'm not perfect, I can't be a successful athlete. Literally, like if I'm not perfect. So they, every time they're not perfect, they feel crushed. We've had college college athletes who felt that way and couldn't move forward because they were so focused on being perfect. They felt that the only way to, to be successful in sports was to be perfect, that every time they messed up, they would beat themselves up and hate themselves, which then, of course, would deter, you know, deteriorate their performance over the long run, ironically. So when you can identify these and delete them and clear them out, everything changes. So that's, that's why not everybody has these problems. Not everybody has these beliefs and programs, but the people who do often find it really challenging to not be critical because those programs are keeping them stuck in, in that way of seeing the world. Yeah, without question. And I love that analogy too, because we are, it's, it's a real easy way of understanding the way we're wired, right? We are the, the most beautifully written code ever written, right? As human beings with the billions of characters and one strand of DNA, you know? So when you think of a website, right, and you think of the code required to create that website, and if that code gets messed with in some way, and there's some extra characters added, it's gonna break the page, right? So when you go on that website, that platform, it doesn't look right. Something's wrong with it. Some stuff works, but some stuff's broken, and it doesn't, oh, it doesn't work when I click on it, and this, that, and the other. But then you need a coder or a programmer to go in and find where that code is broken and remove those areas. And then all of a sudden the web page looks great again and everything works as it should. And that's kind of how we are. And not even kind of, that is how we are. <laughs> and, and so that's ultimately what, what you're doing with the MindFix group is you are, you're able to go in for people, very simply identify these broken pieces of code in their lives and, and pull that out, recognize it, and get rid of it, remove it. So that subtraction thing that you talked about, and then all of a sudden they're like, wow, things are things are working like they're supposed to be here. Um, yes, yes. And, almost, yeah. Oh, no, what, go what's ahead, What's exciting is when you uncover these lines of code and they are, when those are the root causes, the exciting part is that it doesn't have to take a long time and it doesn't require hard work or repetition, which blows people's minds. And I'll give you an example, my favorite example. Let's say you have a problem where every time you see a little kitty cat, you run and you scream, right? If you try to brute force it and talk yourself out of it, it's, it's, it's a hard work. You might, it's hard work. You may have to repeat that 50 times, 60 times, 100 times, and you're still a little nervous. Now, if we uncovered that underneath the surface, you have a line of code that says cats are dangerous. And we deleted that, we subtracted that so that the next morning you walk outside and that doesn't exist in your head at all. And suddenly you see a cat, there's nothing in your mind that's telling you there's any issue here. There's nothing that's saying that cats are dangerous anymore. And once that's deleted, you might just look at the cat and walk by it. There's no thoughts you have to change. There's no anxiety or, or fear that shows up in your body. There's no desire to run away because there's nothing in your mind that says that cats are dangerous anymore. Well, so when you would, when you pull out the, the root or the reason why you're stuck in a certain way of being, it's actually insanely easy. You don't need repetition or hard work or time because that line of code is just gone. So you don't act or feel or think that way anymore. Wow. That's fantastic. I like that. Um, take us back, if you don't mind, to that kind of super low point right, where you were struggling with your own things um, and that shift that happened for you, you had kind of, you'd gone to yet another professional, right, seeking therapy 
trying to get the answers that you were looking for, that you desired, right? And you, you felt stuck. You felt like this, I, I, how can I resolve this? I'm not, and, and then everything that you saw was like, oh, it's going to take this long. It's very complex process. You know, you're going to only make little steps in that, the direction you want to go in on a, you know, on a daily basis. What, what was this moment like for you? What was this epiphany that, that you had? The epiphany I had was that standard, more talking about issues is not the solution. I've been talking about the same issues for 30 years and I can talk all day and talk around any issue. And I used to have this feeling of sometimes like, I think I'm outsmarting my therapists or my coaches. And I, I would go, you know, months and I'm like, you know, if I look back three months, I'm no different. This is, this is not working. There's something about this talking about the issues and learning different tools that's not working for me. Like it's not changing how I feel. Part of me, like up here, I understand I'm good enough. I understand I'm worthy. I understand everything's okay. I get it intellectually. I don't feel it in my body. It doesn't seem real to the rest of me. And so that was when I realized like, I can't keep doing this. I got to look for something different. And, um, when one of my mentors was explaining to me the, you know, your lens and how you see life is different, kind of gave me this glasses example. I, kind of, I got curious and I was like, how can you change your glasses? Like you can't change the world, but man, if I am wearing sunglasses versus my blue blocker glasses, one's going to make the world seem darker, even if it isn't. So how can I change my, my, my lens? instead of trying to, um, you know, soothe myself all the time with all of what I'm experiencing. So that was kind of the, the breakthrough shift uh, realization for me of, I really think there's got to be a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, in mo with most things, there is a, there's always a different option, right? A different way. And even though these there's an abundance of self-help, you know, gurus and coaches and, and programming out there, right, that some people have benefited from. Um, it seems like the, the issues aren't necessarily going away. <laughs> um, there's, they're still there. And then there's a lot of people like you who are struggling for, you know, decades, it seemed, to get over things or get beyond things or remove things entirely um, from, from being in there, you know, and, and I feel for people like that. I, I, I've been so fortunate and blessed, I guess I don't seem to get too wrapped up or tangled up in the messes I've made in my past or my troubled youth or things like that. I've, I've been able to get beyond a lot of that thing, a lot of that stuff. And it, I don't feel stuck there. Um, and I don't know, we're all, again, we're all wired a little bit differently, but I, what I've seen is I've seen a lot of highly successful people who are the ones that are proclaiming how helpful MindFix was for them. And these are people that were already very successful. Um, why is it that so many high achieving successful people are still not satisfied with themselves, with who they are, what they've accomplished? Is it this competitivism that just is at their core where they just as they're so competitive with themselves with other people that they're just never enough that they just can never be happy i think you when we look at someone and we say they're successful or they're beautiful or they're smart we're looking at them and giving them a label that is just one-sided one dimension there are people who are financially successful, but mentally unstable and not very smart and not athletic. Like we are multifaceted and have so many different parts and pieces and characteristics. And I think questioning why would someone come to you if they're already successful is thinking that is probably there's an underlying assumption that if I'm financially successful, everything else is fine. And what we find is that's not necessarily the case. That means that one part of their life may be working but that there's other parts that either have been neglected or not looked at or overridden or um, not you know, addressed. There's plenty of people who have worked so hard they've neglected their relationships and then their fitness and they don't listen to their bodies and then they don't trust themselves. And there's a whole host of side effects that after tw you know, two decades start showing up 
simply because they put their entire life into their business and became financially successful. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with that because I think so many of us, because it's a lot of comparison, right? And people, we, we're always comparing and even it's not necessarily very healthy. It just kind of happens auto, automatically without us even you know, thinking about it too much. Uh, we're, we're comparing, uh, you know, we see posts here or we see this picture over here and, and, and we're um, immediately or we see what this person, the house they live in or the car that they drive and we immediately are like, well, why don't we have that or what are we doing wrong, right? Why, why, why don't we seem to have that same level of, you know, uh, wh whatever it is, something that's good, that's glorified by that other person but oftentimes what you see is that people are highlighting their their one maybe the one thing worth highlighting while like you said the all these other things are falling apart it's it's hard to be across the board really in a good place or really say maybe say balanced uh in life where your personal life your financial life your professional life maybe your spiritual life or all of these things are getting enough time and attention and effort where you've, you know, but I, I think a lot of us just live in this existence of looking at the, our neighbors and looking at other, other people and kind of having this kind of comparison uh, battle that seems evident in our, our daily living. What, what do you think about that? I don't know. I think I get tripped up when I'm in a conversation and it's like, uh, uh, so many of us or a lot of us, I feel like everybody has different variations and flavors of, of challenges and I get nervous like kind of generalizing, I think, right. because I, as in this work, what we find is there, well, there may be some... a broad audience though, right? Yeah. Of listeners from over 80 countries. So I'm trying to be yeah. a, a bit general yeah. with what I'm, the topic I'm, I'm approaching, that's all. I think it's easy. For, for us to fall into comparison. Like, I think you nailed that. It's, it's something where um, when we know all parts of ourselves, like we talked about, we're multifaceted and we're aware of all parts of ourselves, but we only see one or two parts or facets of someone else that are, that's what they're forward facing. It can be easy, like you said, to just fall into that, that pattern. And whether we're even aware of it or not, uh, look at someone else and kind of make judgments and wish that we had something that that facet of them was we wish we had that sure yeah I mean that's that's uh, I'm, I'm a human being just like just like you and the people listening where we all uh, most of us have shortcomings or all of us have shortcomings but most of us aren't willing to put our shortcomings out there or our failures mm -hmm. out there uh, let the world know where we've come short, come up short, or what things we're embarrassed of, right? Things that we're trying to hide under the rug, we don't want people to know about. But I think we're very quick to post or to share or to talk about or highlight the wins, the, the, all the things that we're so, you know, look at, look at me here, look at this trip I went on, look at this thing we just bought, look at this amazing thing that I, that I just did, right? And then when people are seeing that a lot, especially, you know, they're like, wow, this, what a dream life that person must be living versus, well, we don't, we're, they're not showing us the other 23 hours of the day or, you know, the, the time that they got into an argument or the, the job they just were demoted or lost or, you know, we, we just, that's just kind of human nature is, is it not? We're, that's, and I'm not speaking for you, I'm just speaking again for yeah. a lot of oh, people out there. I love that question. The question you asked, that's a fascinating one. Isn't this just human nature? So what I would suggest is that if someone comes to us, and, and this was me before, to a T, um, I would have said before, if you had asked me 10 years ago, is this human nature? And I would have said, of course, like there's no way you can take, you know, this is like just part of who we are. And I experienced it daily. And I used to beat myself up over it. But what I found is if you have those lines of code that are, I'm no good, I'm bad, I'm not good enough, whatever it is, like all these different pieces that are, uh, I'm not capable, I'll never amount to anything, right? If those are floating around in the background and those are in your subconscious, those are in your mind, those are the lines of code running all the time, 24 seven. The self-talk. 
Yeah. This self talk, and again, you may be aware of it. It may be quiet. It may be silent. Like you may, different people have different levels of awareness. However, if those exist there, and then you are looking at other people all the time, if it's like you're never going to amount to anything, you're no good, you're not capable of success. Like then, when you want look at someone, there's going to be a sinking feeling and a sadness and a comparison. However, if those don't exist, if you uh, are, it's like quiet mind. And you're sitting there and you're not doubting your capabilities. You're not doubting if you're good enough. You have faith in, in yourself. And then you look at someone else succeeding. There's far more likelihood that you're going to be able to take joy in their success and celebrate it because it's not a reminder or a mirror or like kicking off all mm-hmm. of those thoughts that are in your in your mind that it's, a, it's not a reminder that you're not going to be okay or that you're not good. So when you delete some of those programs in code, what we find is the, we call it comparison-itis. You know, I compare myself to everybody. That can actually go away. Which sounds too good to be true, I think, for a lot of people li- listening. That it's, is it that easy to, in essence, erase that part of who you are, the, of, of what you goes on in, in your head? Um, but that's... That's what it looks like, what it appears from what I've seen and read and heard from people responding to the work that they've done with the MindFix group, that um, that they're like, it was amazing. It was, it was like happened overnight. Or one, one guy, I think I, he said, what's, what's taken me five months, uh, I did in one day what I, what I couldn't get done in five months in, in, his, in his job. Um, are, are people really this jammed up and this stuck and this, they have this much bad code that they have to (laughs) pull out? (laughs) No, I mean, they're not that jammed. They're not that stuck. We have people coming to us for a whole host of, some people, it's just like, I procrastinate. Some people are like, I'm a salesperson. I'm, I get nervous getting on sales calls. Some people are like, I'm super anxious when I talk to women. Everybody has different areas where they love to shift something. It doesn't mean they're broken. doesn't mean they're super jammed up. doesn't mean there's a lot of things wrong. People just come to us when there's something that's not optimal and they're like, I can't seem to get around this. What's going on? And just like, you know, you can get rid of the belief in Santa Claus and suddenly for the the rest of your life, you will never leave cookies out for Santa Claus again. And that is that that is a permanent change. We can delete a, a belief in something and then the rest of your life you do change and you shift. So it is, it is possible and it's the work that we do. Uh, we have, you know, I think our success rates between 90 to 95%. And it's actually far more reliable to work with um, this than try to help people manage their symptoms better. It's actually addressing the reason why people are experiencing it. And what I'd love to caution is one of the primary things that happens when people come to us is they're like, well, I'm just type A, or I have, you know, a Colby assessment that tells me this, or I'm Myers-Briggs this. So it's just how I am. And what we find is that more often than not with many things that are challenges or problems or causing issues, it doesn't have to be a permanent part of who you are. We've had people who are bulldozers and aggressive be able to, you know, within a few weeks, suddenly it's easy for them to communicate in a calm manner. Or people who thought or were told that they're researchers who couldn't stop gathering more information and more information and couldn't move forward, go, you know what? I don't really need that much data. I can just make a decision quickly and trust my my gut. So we've seen people who came in and said, no, this is just who I am. It's just how I'm wired totally feel completely different in a short period of time, um, which is really freeing because then the boxes and the labels that a lot of people receive as they're, as they're going through life, they don't have to wear those labels. They don't have to sit in those boxes anymore. And that can be really exciting for people to hear. Oh yeah. Without question. Um, and yeah, I think a lot of people have that, that thought that, I'm just wired that way, right? It's just the way I was made. It's the way I've always been, that, that, those kinds of things. But just because you've always been a certain way doesn't make it good or right or <laughs> the way it needs to continue to be. Um, you, can, you can go in and, and, and make these, these changes. And I like that they're, uh, again, that 
as you said at the start, it's it's really a subtraction thing that a lot of us need, um, and it opens up all new opportunity. I mean, somebody as simple as, like you said, is somebody has trouble speaking with the opposite sex, right? Somebody's like, ah, I'm really bad with women. Or you, you get somebody else who, I cannot speak uh, publicly. I'm awful at speaking in front of groups, right? And I mean, my wife would benefit from this. She remembers from a young age, really not liking being up in front of the class. And I think a lot of people could say that's one of the greatest fears, right? In, in, in all of history is public speaking, right? Being in front of a lot of eyeballs. Everyone's looking at me. I, I, I've always been opposite. I've always liked that. So I think that's where like, I'm just an, I'm, I don't say an anomaly, but I'm definitely in the minority with kind of enjoying that, that stage presence. But, um, yeah, I, I'd be curious because this is for everybody. So anyone listening right now, if you're not a quote unquote professional or looking to get help in, in your professional arena, this can help you in your personal life. This can help you in your relationships. This can help you in maybe just, you know, areas of your life that no one else really knows about <laughs> because you've just never cared to share. Uh, in your professional world, but it's, it, it seems like large and small uh, issues are coming your way over at MindFix, and it's it's people of all shapes, sizes, and backgrounds. Mm. You know, I really loved the the fear that you just brought up, the really popular one, how you said, you know, fear of public speaking. So let's say we have person A, you, who doesn't have this fear of public speaking. And we have person B, your wife, who has a fear of public speaking, right? Some people would go, oh, it's, they probably were wired that way. I mean, she remembers feeling that way since she was a young girl. So it's just, you know, they're just wired differently. What I would suggest is that based on what happened in your early childhood and how you each were raised, I guarantee that your wife has some form of, if we were to look at the lines of code and kind of, you know, look at what's going on behind the scenes in her mind, there's probably things, uh, 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 lines of code or beliefs along the lines of, if I make a mistake or fail, I'll be rejected. Public speaking is scary. Um, uh, I have to know what I need to say uh, in, in advance. If I'm not perfect, uh, I will be you know rejected or th bad things will happen. Uh, whatever, like everybody has like a different kind of cluster of like, I have to be perfect, I have to be prepared. If I don't do it right, I will be rejected. Bad things will happen etc. But I would guarantee you that she has a cluster of those. And if we were to clear those out, delete those the same way you delete a belief in the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, those are gone, that she would be able to get up in front of a group and speak um, without an issue. We literally, right before I came on this podcast, we had a fellow who came in and one of the main things he wanted to work on, he rated a scale of one to 10, he said it was a one. It was so bad in his life that he can speak one-on-one -on -one to people, but he cannot speak in a group and every time he tries, he has intense fear. Uh, I was just reviewing his case notes. He's on week seven of about one to two hours a week. He's on week seven and he rated it a nine. He's like, I don't think I even have this issue anymore. I can't remember being scared. Like I went up in front of a whole bunch of groups and there was no fear. So that's the difference that can happen when you identify what his, we identified what his lines of code were, we cleared those out, and suddenly he went from someone who had been terrified his entire life, rated it a one out of 10. A few weeks later, here he is at a nine going, no, why are we talking about this? Let's work on yes. something else. Yes, it is amazing. And it makes me think of my daughter, uh, makes me think of my son, teaching my son to ride a bike and teaching my daughter to kind of be comfortable swimming underwater. And it was an instantaneous change. It was my son, and, and I think most parents experience this with their children, right? Because kids are, are the best. Kids are, in terms of, in terms of getting over themselves, right? Um, kids will make that switch, and this is completely unconscious, like this is not a, a, a decision or a choice necessarily. It's just them overcoming this block and the block is I need my training wheels in order to go in a straight line down the sidewalk. And then you take those training wheels off and run with him. And then he realizes that your hand isn't even holding the seat anymore. 
And wow, look at me riding my bike. I don't need these training wheels. Why did I even think I needed them to, you know, 10, 20 minutes, half an hour later, they're riding wheelies pretty much. I mean, this is, this is kids, you know, and, and they're flourishing on something that just an hour ago they were struggling with. My daughter did the same thing with, with swimming and going underwater. And she went from not wanting to hold her breath underwater for five seconds to doing handstands and watch me do flips. And, and, and this was all in a matter of like a day. Yeah, and yeah. it just shows you how quickly that change can happen. And it was, I think it was in real time, them deleting that, that code. And that's that I, kind of, I need training wheels in order to ride a bike. Right. Oh, that's gone. That one's probably not gonna be coming back for the rest of their life. <laughs> Never, it's gone, it's out, it's yeah. done. Yeah, so um, I, I love it. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. And I, and I think obviously people listening are wondering now, how do I learn more? Where do I go? How do I hear more about Erin and her story? Could you please uh, share some uh, some social channels and, and some platforms? Yeah, of course. The easiest way to kind of follow our journey is to follow me on Facebook, Erin File. I think I'm the only one there. And then our website has a lot of information. I, I recommend starting on our results page so you can see what's possible and what people experience, real people experience. It's like a three mile long page. Um, where you can see what happens when people do this work. We, then if it intrigues you, we have an hour long free training that you can grab and learn more about the process and how everything works together. Um, and that would be a really great place to start. Uh, you know, there's also case studies and other information on the site for people who, who want to dive deeper down the rabbit hole. I love it. And that is Aaron File, the spelling E-R-I-N, last name is File which is with a P, it's P-H-E-I-L, Aaron File, okay? And then the, the website that you want to go to is mindgroup.com. And then Mind if you Fix hit- Mind Fix Group. Yeah, sorry, my, I, did I say mine? Mindfixgroup.com slash results, as Aaron pointed out, because if you go there, you get all these great uh, videos and reactions and reviews. And I think that's where a lot of decision making is made by people anymore, right? Is what did other people have to say about this before I uh, invest my time and resources in it? But uh, it's a terrific uh, uh, site and there's some great video content there and reading for you. So it's been really a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Aaron, for your insights and for your, your work and for sharing all of this with our listeners today. Thank you so much for having me. Huh? It was great. It was fantastic. Listeners, as always, uh, thank you for coming back to the Strong by Design podcast. Go into those show notes, the description area, whatever platform you're listening. You'll see all the links there so you can get to know Erin and all of her great work a little bit better. Be sure to smash that five stars, whatever platform you're listening, and leave us a rating or, or, or sorry, a review. We would love to hear from you. Give us some feedback about this episode, about past episodes, or just our show a, as a whole. We would love to know more from you. We thank you so much. We appreciate you. We're grateful for you. And we'll be back next week, as always, here on Strong by Design. God bless.